everyone. Yeah, unfortunately Sarah was unable to make it, so I'm uh, here and I'm going to talk about a project that we've been working on just over the past few months, um, looking at the genetic structure in a rare cervidine endemic plant. As some of you who have been here for a little while may be able to recognize, it's a California species, surprise. Um, so uh, understanding how genetic variation is distributed within a population is crucial for understanding how evolution has operated on these species in the past, as we just saw with Rob's talk, but also for understanding and predicting how evolution may proceed in the future. And this has obvious uh, consequences for conservation, so if we wanted to predict how to mitigate the effects of climate change or other anthropogenic disturbances, for example, but it also just illuminates how evolutionary and ecological processes are intertwined and uh, how, the, how selection, drift, and gene flows um, have created the extant biodiversity that we see today. So we were really interested in examining how uh, soil and isolation by distance might be contributing to genetic structure in a population of Calcornis. And uh, this species is found on serpentine soils. And for those of you who may not know, um, serpentine soils are patchily distributed throughout the Pacific uh, coast in North America. Um, and they're really stressful environments for plants to grow. They have incredibly high concentrations of uh, toxic heavy metals, most notably nickel and magnesium, very low concentrations of essential nutrients such as um, calcium and nitrogen, and they also have really poor water holding capacity. So as you might guess, this is not a really fun place for plants to grow. Um, and as a result, serpentine endemics have repeatedly evolved from non-serpentine progenitors. And so you have a lot of uh, and, um, endemic diversity on these um, patches. And for even for species which aren't serpentine endemics, adaptation is typically required for these populations to persist. So for example, in Mimulus guttatus, a single QTL locus allows populations to persist on these incredibly stressful soils. But what's often less considered is the fact that serpentine soil itself can often vary quite a lot in its chemistry, and that has potential consequences for plant fitness, and then potential consequences for the distribution of genetic variation in serpentine endemic populations. So uh, the plant that Sarah works with is uh, Calcordus tuberonensis. It is a long-lived perennial with ca the capacity for dormancy, um, it's, uh, general, it's pollinated by generalist insects, so bees and honeybees mostly, but it also has gravity dispersed seeds. So there's this um, potential for a very, for a pretty good gene flow um, by pollination, but uh, also the potential for low gene flow um, through seed dispersal, because seeds rarely fall just more than just a couple centimeters from the maternal plant. Um, and what's really shocking is that the entire range of this species is restricted to a single hilltop in Marin County that is roughly one or half a kilometer, half a kilometer squared. Um, and that is the global distribution for this species. <laughs> and it's found nowhere else. So yeah, it's naturally rare and as a result, it's uh, listed as threatened at both the state and federal levels. So this is the San Francisco Bay, so as you can see, there's San Francisco here, and this is the Tiburon Peninsula in Marin County. And um, on, the, on the peninsula is this reserve um, called Ring Mountain Preserve, and mountain is very generous, it's just kind of a bit of a hill. And this is the reserve where this species is found, and it's only found here. Um, and although it's uh, incredibly threatened, we don't actually have reason to believe that its status is the result of the, urban, the urbanization of this area because this land, although this land was protected until, or sorry, was privately held until 1972, um, and this species was not described before then, despite this whole region literally crawling with exceptional botanists for more than a century before then. So, and also, as you may have noticed, it's like a pretty charismatic plant, so we're pretty confident that if this plant had existed somewhere else before all the development occurred, it would have been described, and it just wasn't. Um, and so here's a picture just of the site. So serpentine uh, soils tend to be inhabited primarily by these grasslands, and this is the view from one of uh, Sarah's uh, demographic sampling sites. And this is the plant itself, Sonus flowers. Um, so it's got these long, strap-like leaves. And this image is sort of what you also just tend to expect to see when you look at serpentine soils. They don't tend to have a lot of, uh, uh, they tend to be unproductive, so there's not a lot of 
um, biomass or plant biomass found on them. And uh, on Ring Mountain, Sarah has set up these six discrete uh, sampling locations to look at the demography of uh, Calcordis tuberonensis, and I'm just going to shorten that to CADI uh, to save my tongue some, uh, yeah, <laughs> some work. And uh, it's found on both this uh, west-facing slope and east-facing slope. And on the west-facing slope, there's high-density populations and although Sarah has set up these discrete sampling locations, CADI is found in between them as well. So this is sort of a continuous distribution. Whereas on the east side of the slope, you have these low density populations that are truly discrete. So between each of these sites, you won't find any CADI at all in between them. And uh, just uh, to point out, I think in a couple, yeah, we're gonna be comparing uh, Western Ridge and Petroglyph Rock a couple of times like on this next slide. <laughs> so like I said, Sarah has been doing some demographic work and what's also just interesting to note is that the demographic rates that she has calculated for these different patches tend to vary. So you have um, a positive population growth on Petroglyph Rock and negative population growth on Westwood Ridge. And there's also quite a bit of difference in the structure or the demo demographic structure of these patches as well. So the goals with our work were to determine whether we can detect any spatial genetic structure associated with uh, isolation by distance, especially given the patchy nature of uh, caddy on that eastern facing slope, or whether or not there's an effect of variable soil chemistry on these serpentine soils. And to do that, we obviously also needed to quantify variation in soil chemistry where caddy is found. And so to do this, um, we expected, yet yeah, to see that there potentially might be limited seed dispersal leading to isolation by distance. And again, as we see with those um, discrete patches on the east facing slopes, and that variation in soil chemistry could be structuring genetic diversity in these populations. So to do this, um, we had paired sampling of plant tissue and soil um, for 24 individuals across six of those patches. Um, maybe, yeah, <laughs> I'll talk about this later or very soon. Um, and then uh, soil chemistry was evaluated as the abundance of 22 different elements in nitrogenous compounds, and if individuals were sequenced using um, double digest rad seq, and then assembled using stacks, or those loci were assembled using stacks, I should say. Um, but first I'm gonna talk about the variation in soil chemistry that we found. So here are the different sampling locations, and what you may note is there's not a lot of structure that's falling out in this um, ordination of soil chemistry. And what's really notable is that at this Western Ridge sampling location, it encompasses almost the entirety of this first um, axis of variation. And uh, this is plot 12, and this is plot 13, and they are found within five meters of each other. So not only do you have quite a bit of variation in soil chemistry with insights, that's, that variation is incredibly fine-grained and somewhat randomly distributed across the landscape, which makes it a very unusual sort of environmental gradient to potentially have an adaptation for. And just to really drive that uh, home, this is nickel abundance across the 24 plots. And as you can see, these two plots that are quite close to each other have some of the, one of them has some of the highest nickel uh, found at this, these sites, and the other has some of the lowest. And we see the same sort of pattern when we look at the ratio of calcium to magnesium. Um, so just to actually see if there was any discrete structure in genetic variation, we just uh, did a structure test um, looking across all 24 individuals ranging from one to six potential subpopulations. And maybe unsurprisingly, <laughs> the best reported um, uh, uh, sorry, cluster was that there was no discrete genetic structure. So even when you look at k equals two and k equals three, there's not anything really obviously jumping out. So that means that we can treat this whole distribution as a single population, which maybe isn't surprising given the very, very limited range that this species encompasses. Um, but then we wanted to see whether or not there are still some less discrete uh, signatures of genetic distance or soil chemistry on these populations. So we used a generalized dissimilarity model, which um, we're using uh, geographic distance and soil properties as explanatory variables. And the way this works is it takes a matrix of distance calculations, so in our case that was genetic distances as the independent variable, and then TRIAD uses a generalized linear model framework to relate that to distance matrices of the response variables, in this case, geographic distance, geographic distance and soil properties. And then it uh, is able to rank the importance 
of those uh, uh, response variables um, in addition. Yeah. So again, <laughs> in line with what we found for structure, there was no effect of uh, distance on structuring the genetic variation of this population, which again, not, maybe not that surprising. Pollinators are doing a good job of moving genes around. Um, bees can travel a lot farther than half a kilometer. Um, but what we found was that soil chemical properties explained 57% of the variance in gen uh, pairwise genetic distance. And uh, so this, these are all of the so, uh, elements or compounds that were included in our analysis. And what you see is that uh, barium, magnesium, and copper had the largest impact or explained more, comparatively more of the variance than a lot of the other elements. And this was kind of surprising because given what we know about serpentine soils, we had expected magnesium, nickel, and calcium to be some of the most predictive elements. And so we definitely found that magnesium is important in this uh, population, but we definitely have no idea what's going on with barium. <laughs> um, and so what we think we found is some preliminary support for the importance of soil chemistry on genetic composition in this population, this really rare species. And interestingly, we also wanted to bring up the fact that this has a relatively or this population has relatively high expected heterozygosity for rad loci, upwards of um, 0 0.02. And what we think, or are speculating, <laughs> that might be going on is that we have evidence uh, for balancing selection based on variation in soil chemistry um, and, the, like I said, the very fine-grained nature of the soil at this site. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I've got to say. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Um, on behalf of... Oh, sorry. I should do this. I'm going to keep on. On behalf of Sarah, Sarah works at Mills College and definitely needs to thank all of these undergrads who contributed a lot to the work. And I'm at the U of A and would like to thank my lab for the support and help getting this together. All right. Okay, then. Do I have time to do questions? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, at Ring Knock, uh, as in many certain gene areas, there is uh, a very important factor. I'm not I'm saying that soil chemistry is not important. It's a very important factor you guys need to measure, which is soil depth. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, Timbernensis uh, frequently occurs in the shallower soils, right where the serpentine is outcropping, right? And uh, uh, I, 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 I would recommend 